And I do pray that I say something that will help someone. The message I'm going to be preaching this morning is something that should bring you into conviction. And I mean conviction to win souls, to get people saved. And if you're here today lost, I pray that what's said should bring you into conviction to get saved before it's eternally too late. Would you turn with me in your Bible to Luke chapter 16 and verse number 19? I hope you don't mind if I shed this thing because I'm going to be swept anyway. Luke chapter 16, verse 19. And it came to pass, and the beggar died, and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water, and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thou good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee, therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead... They will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. You've read the scripture text that Jesus Christ gave us, Luke chapter number 16, about a man that died and went to hell. I want you to think with me for just a little while about if someone were to die, and today a lot of them are going to die. Every five minutes, I do not know how many thousand leave this world to go out to meet God. But when they die, and the soul leaves this body, they either die to go to be with Jesus, or they die, and they go to hell. And when this man died, he went to hell. The Bible said Abraham died, and lifted up his eyes with Abraham in his bosom. But the rich man died, and he lifted up his eyes in hell. The Bible has some definitions about hell. We are not left at a loss as to what the place looks like. The Lord has told us quite a bit about it. As a matter of fact, most of the messages that he preached were on hell. He preached a great deal about hell. And I heard a man yesterday morning out here in the parking lot. I was somewhere, and I turned the radio on, and I heard a young man on the radio talking about hell. That was the first message that I had heard on hell on the radio in a long, long time. Not much of it in Knoxville, Tennessee, preaching on hell. But my friend, I believe that's something that we need to hear. It's about hell. When a man dies and his soul leaves this body, the first thing that strikes him is... That he's no longer in the same place that he was. But he realizes that he starts falling into a pit. The Bible said that hell is a place of a bottomless pit. It is a place where this individual starts falling, falling, falling. The greatest sensation he realizes is that head over heels he's falling, falling, falling down into a pit. He's going further and further and further away from any love, from any peace, from any joy, from any rest. From anything that anyone would ever want, this man is going further and further and further away. And he keeps falling and falling and falling. You see, he's died, and it's too late for him. Once an individual dies without God, my friend, you can't pray over their body. It's too late. There's not a thing you can do for them. They're gone. And he falls. And he continues to fall. But beneath him, hell opens its mouth. And beneath him, the screams and the wailing of the damned are coming up into his ears. He realizes that beneath him is another world, a world that he's never seen before, a world that he's had no part in, a world that he doesn't want any part of, but it's something he has no control over whatsoever. He's going down now, and his soul is being carried ever so swiftly down into the pit, and he continues to fall. The screams are reaching his ears, and the smell... And the smell of that that's coming up out of the pit of the dam. He smells it. And he hears it. And there's no doubt in his mind what lies beneath him. He knows that he's going there. And he can't stop it. And he continues to fall. And the heat now. Not only do the screams rise up into his ears. Not only does he smell the smell of the stench of the decaying matter beneath him. And the smell of hell, well, my friend, the heat begins to rise up and engulf him. And he realizes that the deeper he falls into this pit, that the hotter it gets. And down he goes, deeper and deeper and deeper into the pit. 
The screams are growing louder and the heat is hotter. Why? Because he's falling, my friend, into a pit. And the pit in the Bible is described as hell. So down he goes and he can't stop himself. Maybe he claws at the sides. Maybe he does everything he can to try to stop this terrible plight that he's about to enter into. But I'm afraid it's too late. It's too late when you die, my friend. It's entirely too late. And down he goes ever further into the pit. Now the heat is unbearable. The heat has surrounded his body. And there, everywhere he turns, there's no peace. There's no way to get out of this searching, this searing pain that's cutting at him all around. He screams and he begs and he pleads. But it does him no good. There's no ear for his plea to fall upon. Nobody loves you in hell. Nobody's concerned about your suffering in hell. Nobody wants to hear about your plight when you go to hell. They're crying too. And they're weeping and they're wailing and they're moaning too. And down he goes. He's clawing and he's scratching and he's gnashing his teeth. He's gnashing his teeth because the pain now is unbearable and there's nowhere to go to. He can't get out of it. There's nothing he can do. And he continues to fall. But he realizes he's not alone. All around him are others that have gone on before him into the pit, into the terrible place called hell. And there they are weeping and they're wailing and they're gnashing their teeth and they're screaming. And some of them are screaming and praying and screaming and praying and praying and screaming. But it does them no good. Maybe all over the place you can hear the voices of people as they repent and they cry out to God from the depths of hell. And they say, God, God, please, if there's just one slight chance that I might be saved, please hear me now. I will ask out of this terrible place, but the sound of the dam that goes off of the walls of hell, and it doesn't reach any higher to the ears of God. He has closed the pit of hell, and there are no sounds of mercy arising out of that terrible sinking place. There is no mercy in hell. There's no peace in hell. There's no rest in hell. It's nothing but weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth in hell, and down he goes, and he continues to fall. And now there are those around him that are gnashing upon him and they're crying and they're screaming and they're tearing at him. And he fights to get away from them. And they fight to get away from him because he's screaming and gnashing. It's nothing but a madhouse like a pack of dogs as they tear one dog apart in the midst of them. That's all it is in hell. You say, when I get to hell, I'll have a big time with my crowd. Those that I've enjoyed my drunken party with here upon the earth. No, my friend, you'll scream when you get to hell with them, just like they scream. And I want you to know that my God is love. The Bible said He's love. And the Bible said if you don't love your brother, then you don't know God. And I know that. But I also know that His love comes to the pit of hell. And once that door is stopped, the love of God will not open that pit up again and go on down beneath it because He stays His hand and you continue to fall. You can't imagine how hot it would be. You say to yourself, I don't see it. I can't understand. You say to yourself, how could God be merciful? How could God be a just God and allow someone to go to hell? God Almighty is an all-knowing God. He knows everything there is to know. He brought out a good point a moment ago about that aircraft that Christ. It crashed because every soul was on that plane that God had brought together that day to go down for it to be the last day that they'd ever live upon planet Earth. Every one of them are dead. And tomorrow or the next day, there's going to be about 150 new made graves scattered out all over this country from those that died. And out of the 150 that died, how many of them went to hell? How many of them just like that went down into the pit and have been falling ever since then? Can you see the man as he reaches up? As he tries to cling to the sides and he looks up and he's going down and he wants out of the pit. But there's no getting out of the pit. Once you go to hell, friend, there you'll stay forevermore. And down you continue to fall. The heat is terrible. You're gnashing your teeth. And all the memories as they flash through your mind of every opportunity you ever had to get saved. Of that preacher you made fun of there that gave you a track 
and tried to tell you about Jesus. Of the preacher that witnessed to you there in the church in the altar one day, but you wouldn't listen to him and you wouldn't get saved. Of the times when you were a child that mama told you about Jesus and you said you didn't need him for just a little while longer. Let me live out my teenage years and have a big time and run with the boys and girls. And when I get older, that's for older folks, you say, I'll get saved. And all of those thoughts are running through your mind. And all of that memory begins to haunt you. Because in vivid three-dimensional color, right before your very eyes, never to be taken away, is the picture, my friend, of those that you love the most, of that that you miss the most, of that that would bring the greatest agony to your soul, of that that would make you cry the loudest, of that that would hurt you the most. The purpose of hell is to inflict torment. The purpose of hell is for God's justice and retribution to be brought upon a sinner. And there, my friend, it will not be loose. It's upon you forever. Down you go. No hope. You've cried a thousand times. You've screamed till you can scream no more. You've begged and you've pleaded. You've prayed and you've prayed and you've prayed and you've prayed. I'll tell you if you want to have a prayer meeting. You open the pit of hell and you listen to the souls that have gone on. That know not God. But let them have five minutes in this altar this morning to get saved. I'll guarantee you we would sing no more invitation hymns. They'd come running to the altar, and upon their face they'd meet their maker. They'd plead for salvation from God, and you couldn't hold them back. Nothing would spare them. They'd be saved. But I'm afraid God doesn't do it that way. For the just shall live by faith. I got saved a day. I looked back to Calvary at my bleeding, dying Savior. I got saved the day that I asked God to have mercy upon my soul. And since that day I've never seen Jesus my natural eye. Oh, but I've heard his voice. I've felt his presence. I've seen his power. And I know he's real. He's in my soul this morning. And he's there forevermore. I am his. And he is mine. But my friend, it's a shame that the one in hell has no mercy. And he has no peace. But that's not all. Hell's not the end of it. You study your Bible, you know something worse than that's coming one of these days. I mean, even though the pit is terrible, and the man falls, and he falls, and he falls, and he screams. My friend, one day, as he goes down in that pit, head over heels falling, I don't know, maybe if he died today, it'd be a thousand and seven years before he heard the call. But I know one thing, I know one thing, that one day, the whole chambers of hell will sound with the echo. I know one day that every single soul that has gone on without God will hear the sound as the sound of thunder, as the voice of the Almighty, as the power of God, as the one the Bible said in Hebrews 1 that upholds all things by the word of His power. And when the Bible said all things, it means all. It means that hell is fueled by the power of God. It means that as long as God lives, there be a hell. And friend, he's not dead and he's not going to die. And I want you to know when the sound comes that the whole chambers of hell will echo and that soul that had been falling will stop falling. And instead of falling, he starts coming up out of the pit. Can't you imagine the day when God reaches down and he opens that terrible lid and all of that stink, all of that screaming, all of the slime, all of the degradation of hell begins to rise up. Can't you see the picture when the day that God opens hell and out they come. And listen friend, that power locks on to that soul in hell. And instead of falling, he finds himself rising. He cannot control that any more than he could going down. Listen, once you leave this world, you've got no control over what happens to you then. You've got every control this morning upon what happens to you. All you've got to do is believe in Jesus and be saved. But when you die, you have no say so in the matter. Out you come. Up to the top again. You haven't seen sunlight in a thousand and seven years. Jesus came, friend, tonight, and you died today, it'll be at least a thousand and seven years before this happened. 
but it'll be the first time in a long time that you've seen any light. But it won't be sunlight that you see that day when that pit opens up and out you come. You're going to come into another world you've never been in before. For all around is nothing but utter bleak black darkness. I mean, when you look out to where Pluto was, there is no Pluto. When you look to the east to where the sun was, there is no sun. When you look to where the planets were, there are none. You see, the Bible said in Revelation chapter number 20 that the heavens and the earth fled away, and there was no more place for them. That means that one day God's Son going to lift His hand, and when He raises it to the point that He calls the power forth, it'll be gone. In the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, it will be gone. It will melt with fervent heat. It will be gone. The Bible said the elements shall melt with a fervent heat. What's that for, preacher? Out of all of that, out of the utter blackness of eternity, that's the way it was, you know, before God ever made anything. There was just God the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Just the three of them. Before there ever was a cherubim or an angel or a Lucifer, before anything was, there was God the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost in perfect love and communion among them. But my beloved friend, one day that'll happen again. Nothing, nothing, nothing but the inhabitants of hell coming up. And seated in heaven, upon a beautiful throne, is the darling of my soul, is the Savior of my soul, is my God and my King, is my Lord and my Master, is the Alpha and the Omega, is the beginning and the end, is the Word, the Son of Abraham, the Son of David, the Son of Man, the Son of God, seated upon a throne, with a vast host of heaven around him. Nothing beneath them, my friend. There is no planet to stand on. There's no air to stand on. Just the throne. And people, 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 as far as your eye can see, are people. Beautiful people. You say, how beautiful, preacher. All of them replicas of the one sitting upon the throne. Made alive and made anew in the Son of God. For we shall bear His image. I bear the image of the earthly today. But glory to God, hallelujah, I shall bear His glorious image. There they stand. No old people with hair falling out and with arthritis in their joints bent over a cane. No more dear old saints lying in bed for 30 or 40 years eaten up with disease, waiting and pleading for the moment that God calls them home. No more cancer to eat away at the body and let the loved one lie in a hospital bed while Mama and the rest of them stand around the bed and they weep and they cry and they look up into their eyes and say, Mama, who brought that man into this room? And as you look around the room, maybe one standing there just as beautiful, my friend, as he's always been. Mama, who's that man? I'll tell you what happened when I was a child. My grandfather told me about one of his boys that passed away when he was 12 years old. And my friend, when he passed away at 12 years old, he told them about a man standing in the room with them. And that man was a beautiful, brilliant man of light. He came, what for? Well, he reached in there and he picked up the soul of that little boy. And he just patted him real good and he took him right on up to glory with him. Well, that's the light that I'm talking about this morning. He's the Son of God. And Satan tries to manufacture a false light and appears a false Christ. Power has you. Up you go. And you see that great vast host as they're suspended in heaven. And all of them gathered around the throne. Every one of them looking to the throne. They're not looking at each other. They're looking at the throne. They're not worried about each other. They're looking at the throne. And they see one high in the kid up. And there the eyes are fixed upon the Son of God. But there's something funny about this throne. Before him a great book set. And this book contains names. Names that have been written in blood. Names that are read. And they're easy to read. For the one that wrote them, wrote them with a perfect hand. And he wrote the name and he knew how to spell it. And there were no mistakes ever made. No problem of ever having to erase it and make it over again. When he wrote that name in that book in blood, it stayed there. And there the book lies in front of him. Stand aside, would you please? Now look at him. That air terrible soul that has been brought up out of the pit with the slime and filth of his self-righteousness hanging from him. 
Maybe his form has been altered just a little bit with his short stay in hell. Well, my friend, my Savior became a worm for me, didn't he? This Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man. And Jesus Christ said, you are of your father the devil. Well, the devil has three forms, doesn't he? And he's the great red dragon right now. We know that. We know that if you're of your father the devil, and I bear the image of my father, my father is Jesus Christ, God the Father, then they'll bear the image of their father. And so you start to change. You don't look like you did when you went to hell. But you still have your memory. Step aside, please. Let him through. And you walk up before the judge on that day. And the lights are bright. You can't stand it. You cover your face. What are you standing on? You look around and nothing under you. He's holding you up. And you stand before him. And he opens the book. And he comes to the letter of your name. And I don't know what your name is spelled by, but say it's K. He comes to the case. He puts his finger on the book. And he runs it down. And he comes to where your name should be recorded. And it's not there. And then he looks you square in the eye. And as you stand there, he says, speak. And with a hand pointed at you, you'll have your day in court. You've been in hell. Maybe you've learned how to take your peace. Maybe you've learned enough in the lawyer room of hell to become a great advocate when you stand before God to take your peace. You say, I'm a big man. I know what I can do and what I can't do. I'll worry about it later. I'll take care of myself. You'll have the day. And then the book is opened and your chance is there in silence. All through heaven there's silence. God gives that soul the opportunity to take his part. Speak. And now it's your turn. Well, God, what about the heathen? It is written. What about the Jew? It is written. What about those that never heard? It is written. What about the hypocrites in the church? It is written. And after you have exhausted every excuse you have, you've said everything you can think to say, then he points at you and says, See these nail prints in my hands? See this in my side? See these prints in my feet? They're for you. Look at the blood. Look at the blood-washed throne. And you look around you. And you look at the faces of people who love God and are saved. And he says to you, you could have been one of them. And you notice a familiar face standing there. One you knew in the world. Mama. I don't know how many mamas prayed pray for the son to be saved. Mama. Mama. Oh, you know what Mama looks like, but she's never been as pretty. Her Mama was a lot older than that last time you saw her. And you say, Mama, is that you? And you know it's her. Maybe she reaches her hand out to you. Mama, my God, can anything be done? I've suffered so long. Oh, Mama, if you only knew where hell, where I've been, hell is terrible, Mama. Oh, please, say a good word for me. I'm sorry, son, nothing can be said. Oh, Mama, please, I'm sorry. You've had your day in court. He raises his hand and he points. Now listen, it's quiet. No singing, no rejoicing. It's quiet. Right now, it's not quite in heaven. Then it will be. Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. I never knew you. Oh, the sound rings in your ears. For the first time in your life, you know that judgment is forever now. Maybe you entertained a slight hope when you came out of hell. 
Maybe when you knew you weren't burning like you had been before, maybe God gave you a reprieve. Maybe God gave you a second chance. And you were hoping that this day, oh, when I get there, oh, maybe God is just going to give me a little place back there somewhere. Oh, when he puts his hand in front of you, and he said, depart. He strikes home to your soul. There is no second chance. That hell was just where God kept you until he put you in this terrible place. What place, preacher? They come and get you. One on one arm and one on the other. And you look at your mama and God and they take hold of you and they drag you away. And you scream. You scream. Oh, no! No! And away you go. That's not it. That's not what it's for. You hear it behind you. Yes, you hear it. What do you hear? You hear the roaring. You remember that sound because that's what hell sounded like. The roaring of a fire. This one's louder. How could it be louder, preacher? It's bigger. You hear the sound of the roar. And it's behind you. And you know where you're going now. Oh, you fight and you plead and you beg and you reach for mama, but the hand won't let you go. You try to get away, but you can't get away. Where can you go? What can you do? You can't do anything. And the way they drag you, and the last sight you see is that great throne. As they all look once again to Jesus, sitting upon a throne. And there your mama, maybe her eyes follow you just a little way. And she turns her head back. And she looks at you for the last time, crying. Her tears are rolling off of her cheeks. God has to allow it, I suppose. There has to be a time for your judgment to be complete. For every good deed you ever saw. For every good word you ever heard. And for every time the gospel touched your soul. There's going to begin to count for that. And I suppose that's God's way of doing it. And you know your time is up. And you hear that terrible roar behind you. Oh, the roar! And those angels take you and they toss you into the lake. A lake as far as the eye can see. Boiling, bubbling, spitting fire into the sky where there is no sky. A lake burning with fire and brimstone. And you're tossed bodily into that lake. And you go into the lake and just sat fast. You're completely covered with the fire and the brimstone. And it burns from your feet to your head. And you squeeze and you fight and you thrash. And you're in a lake of fire. And the arm comes up and up. And you try to pull yourself up. What for? It'll do you no good. And as that hand reaches, gaping for the last time, and it comes down, 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 beneath the surface of that lake, and you go into the lake of fire and brimstone to burn forever and ever. And then the last soul to be judged at that judgment, and the last scream to be heard for the Son of God gathers your mama and all the rest of them around and they come. Come in close, he says. Come in close. Lifts his hand and he starts at the right hand. And as that hand crosses every face, no more crying, but a smile. And when it reaches the other side, every tear has been wiped away. Every memory has been gone. She doesn't know you anymore. She will not be tormented with your mind, but thinking of you forever. She won't even know you ever existed. It's gone, wiped away. You're in hell, and you'll burn forever. Aren't you glad that if you die, and you know Jesus, the very moment your soul leaves your body, you hear music. And you see light. 
And you see loved ones. And as you come fleeing closer to them, you see the joy of heaven. You see the bliss and peace and love and light of some God. Aren't you glad that if you know Jesus Christ, the moment you die to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord? Aren't you glad? Paul said, I have a desire to be with him which is far greater. But therefore, to remain with you is needful. Aren't you glad, my friend, that if you're saved, you'll be with Jesus forever? But if you're not saved this morning, hell will be your home. Hell will be your home. That hand is gone now. Out he stretches his hand, and it all made new. Whatever he chooses to create his witness, all made new. Let's bow your head just a moment. Father, I want you to use what I've said. I want you to speak to souls. If there's someone here lost, the message, Lord, I pray, would dig deeply within their heart, and God, that they can't stand it until they do something about their eternal soul. God save this morning. God save. Father Christians who've lost their love of souls and their desire to win souls, maybe this will stir them up, give them more of a desire. God use it. God use it for your glory. I love you, Lord, and I praise your name this morning for the sweet spirit that's here. Now, Lord, use this message. Your heads are bowed. Your eyes are closed. The brother just gave me the service, and I know he'd want you to come. If you're lost, I know he'd want you to come. Why don't you just come down here? This brother's going to sing something. And while he's singing, I want you to just step out of your seat. Walk down to the front. And somebody will meet you with a Bible and show you how to get saved. Listen to him sing. <clears throat> September the 17th, 1946, a record book started. In heaven, the angel recorded in that book, born, General Hospital, Knoxville, Tennessee, baby boy, Charles W. Lawson. Nine years later, baptized, Beaumont Avenue Baptist Church, Charles W. Lawson. Thirteen years. Boy starting to be rebellious. Talking back to his grandparents. Very stubborn. Seventeen years of age. He enters the Marine Corps. He learns how to cuss. He learns how to drink. He learns how to be a big man. Very rebellious. Very self-centered. Love self. Age of 21. Age of 20. He marries Linda Going. Still a drunkard. Still self-centered. Still love self. Age of 21. Discharged from the Marine Corps. 
goes to work, still a drunkard, still self-centered, still loves self. March 1973, 10.15 p.m., bowed his head, asked you to forgive him of his sins. His soul got saved that night. He got born again. Nine years ago, the record book stopped. From that day on, another book took my record. Everything that was done from that day forward was entered into another book. The book for that purpose, to judge me for rewards. Bless my soul. Give me peace and a home in heaven. But the day that I met Jesus, 1973, March, the day that I got born again, recorded in heaven, the greatest day of my life. Listen, friend, do you know there's a day where you got born again? Do you know it? Do you know without a shadow of a doubt there's a day? I'm not talking about some general vague thing that you seem to hope maybe that's when it was. I'm talking about a day in your life when you know that you met God through His Son, Jesus Christ. You say, no, preacher, I just don't know if there's a day. Well, come down here this morning and let this day in July be the day that God records in heaven they got born again. Why don't you do it right now? Come this morning. Come on, right now. He's going to sing one more verse. While your heads are bowed, would you come? Now I'm the child with the heavenly home. My holy father has made me. By his blood and I'm clothed in his love and someday I'll sing with the angels above. Oh yes, oh yes, I'm a child of the king. My has made me his own now I'm born in his love and I'm born with his love and someday I'll sing with the angels above all right let's all stand up and let's ask the song leader to please come up and lead us in whatever he's chosen and this is your opportunity. If no one moves, then you'll be closing the altar call. But we want you to have this opportunity. Would you please come? Get saved. Rededicate your life. Whatever your need is today, you know that Jesus Christ can meet every need that you have. He said, I shall supply your need. Amen? And he will. Would you trust him? Come on while we sing. All right. I'm glad for the message. Let's bow our heads for just a moment. Maybe there's nobody here this morning that's lost. Maybe there's nobody that needs to be saved. The message has been clear, plain, simple, straightforward. You understand it. If you don't know the Lord is your Savior, and if you're not saved, don't leave this day without the Lord. The picture that He has painted of hell is a true and a real picture. We could never describe the awfulness and the torment of it, the pain, the agony. Those words cannot describe what it's like. I'm glad today to know that I'm not going to that place. may have to suffer a lot. may have to go through something, but I'm not going to go to there. I'm not going to go there to find out how bad it really is. I'm going to believe God. And God said it was bad. I don't, he said it was terrible. I don't want to go there. We that are saved 
There's people that live on the same street with us that are going to go and burn in that place. There's aunts, there's uncles, there's mothers, there's fathers, there's brothers, there's sisters, there's cousins. They're going to go there. Unless somebody tells them how not to go, how to get out of it, how to miss it. Now, if you're lost today, you didn't want to come in the invitation, but you want to be saved, after the service, you find a Christian, or a brother lost one, myself, tell us you'd like to be saved. We'll be glad to take the time, take the Bible, and show you how you can be saved. Now, if you are a Christian, I know that the Lord has spoken to your heart, He's spoken to mine. We need to wake up. Hell's real. It's burning. That rich man's been down there nearly 2,000 years now, screaming, begging, crying. Lost people, people without Jesus Christ, are going to go there. Appreciate the message. Appreciate the man that brought it. This kind of message is that made America a great country like it was. The kind of men who stood, preached the truth, stood for the truth, and told it just exactly like it is. Think about it. Father, I pray today you'd bless the words of this message. Speak to the heart of every person that's in this building this morning. They're lost and without the Lord Jesus Christ. They never really realized that hell is a real place. I pray that today they'd realize it. They've never seen it pictured, Lord, like it was today. I pray that they'd see it vividly and really. Lord, I pray that they might forget lost them. They might forget this church. They might forget this town. Lord, if they're here lost without Thee, may they not forget the message that's been preached today. May they not forget the truth and the reality of what's been spoken of today. God, may they have no rest day nor night. May they have no peace in this life until they trust Thee as their Savior. Lord, I know it would be better for them to suffer here. I know it would be better for them not to have peace here. That would lead to them getting saved and to go to hell and burn forever and never have peace once again. Deal with their heart. Don't let them leave this building without Jesus Christ. God, for us that are saved, awaken us. Lord, revive us, stir us, quicken our minds and our heart and our conscience that we might see hell is real. The people that live around us, the town that we live in, the loved ones, the relatives we have, Lord, they're going to die and go to hell without thee. Lord, give us boldness, give us courage, wisdom, and strength to tell them about a Savior that loves them, about a God who doesn't want them to go to hell, about a Lord and a Savior who will save them if they'll trust him and believe on him. Bless the message and the word of God that was preached today. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you and good day. February of 1975. At that time, I was an alcoholic out of control. Uh, I was also using uh, recreation drugs, but primarily alcohol was my drug of choice. And uh, I totally was out of control. And I had a lot of friends in the entertainment business, and Hoyt Axton happened to be one of them. Ringo Starr and a bunch of people. And so they were having a TV special on the West Coast. And so Hoyt had called me and asked me if I would like to go uh, or come out. And I told him, yeah, I would love to, because I knew there was going to be a lot of booze. I knew there was going to be partying. And while they were doing their special, uh, I was doing my thing. And so after about three or four days out there, I became ill, and uh, by ill I mean I, be I had a severe pain in my abdomen. I flew into Oklahoma City and uh, called a senator friend of mine and told him I had to have a car because I was ill, I was sick. So s they sent a car and they took me home and I checked into the hospital at Wadley Hospital in Texarkana in February of 1975. I checked in with electrolytes, which means my potassium, my chlorides, and various chemicals were so far out of balance that uh, they had to give me IVs to build me up. Now, at that time in my life, I was an atheist. Uh, I was a hardcore atheist and uh, was living for myself. Uh, atheists uh, are self-centered, and they live for themselves. And this is where I found myself in 1975 in the hospital and they took three days and then they operated me and when they operated me I found myself in intensive care I woke up on a respirator which means they were breathing for me uh, I was I couldn't speak but I you know and I had been laying there in a coma and I had heard these people talk about how sick I was and how I was going to die and how I wouldn't get out of the hospital 
And at that time, my hair was very, very long because I, uh, I just wore my hair long. And I heard one guy say, my, his hair is long. And another guy said, not nearly as long as it's going to be before he gets out of here. And a third voice said, he's not going to get out of here. He's going to die. And after three days, I could breathe on my own. And I remember my doctor, my surgeon, a guy by the name of Donald Duncan. He told me, he says, Don, if you have anything to get right, if you have anything to get signed, you get it done because we're not sure. We're not sure how long you have. So I knew, see, I had a condition that was called acute hemorrhagic necrotic pancreatitis. You don't live with this disease. Now, you can live with pancreatitis. You can even live with acute pancreatitis. But you do not live with acute hemorrhagic necrotic pancreatitis. Duncan had told my two sons that I would be dead before morning. They didn't expect me to survive. And, uh, you know, I'm laying there. Now, I, I'm a professed atheist. And when I say a professed atheist, I didn't believe in God. Uh, I believed in the power of the universe because I had seen it. You know, I'd seen it, life and death. As a physician, I dealt with life and death. I, I believed in something, but don't talk to me about God, and surely don't talk to me about a resurrection or a virgin birth or this type of thing, because I am in research science. PhDs in research science, the majority of them do not believe in God. They do not believe in a supreme being. They believe, that, and they're beginning now to believe that there is order in the universe. Uh, because as we get farther and farther along, uh, we see the order. But I was an atheist. Now see, it's very easy to be an atheist when you're successful. You have worked your way from Oklahoma welfare to being one of the most powerful men in your part of the country, one of the most powerful men in the state of Oklahoma in relationship to political. It's very easy to be an atheist when you have done all of that. Man can sit back and say, I don't need God. What is God? But it's very difficult to be an atheist when you're laying on your deathbed because you begin to think, what if these people are right? See, there'd been one man by the name of Ron Short that had stood between me and the gates of hell. One man that had witnessed to me about the love of Jesus for five years before I became ill. One man. And, you know, I would debate him. And I liked him because he did what he said he was going to do. I mean, he was the only one that I saw that professed to be Christian that lived what he said he was going to do. Uh, and so I, I really respected him. I didn't believe what he said, but I respected him. But when I'm laying on my deathbed and knowing that I'm going to die, guess who I thought about? I thought about, what if Ron is right? What if there is a heaven and a hell? And so the most immediately, immediately, the most pressing thought in my mind is, how do I get saved? What is saved? What is saved? How do I get saved? And so I sent them for Ron Short. I wanted him to come down uh, because I wanted him to do ever what he had to do. I had no idea. How can a man hanging on a tree in Israel 2,000 years ago, what is that to me? But I knew that he had something that I had to have. And that night, see, I had him go for Ron, but Ron wasn't home. Ron was in Alabama. And so I had him go and send for Ron. And that night was the longest night that I've ever had in my entire life before or since. And that night is as I would be laying there in bed. As I'm laying there in bed, I would begin to fade away. I would begin to fade away, and as I would fade away, I would begin to go down. It, now, it was like darkness. It was like, it was so, so dark. It was like the very darkness just penetrated into your very, very being. And as I left, and I can tell you I left my body because I remember when I came back into my body. 
You know, I don't know where I was out of my body. Now there are people that talk about the, the, a light. There are people that talk about floating above. There are people that talk about a feeling of warmth and love. I didn't feel any of that. I felt none of that. I felt untold terror. Untold terror. Because I knew that if I ever went all the way, if I slipped all the way, I would never get back. Now, in my beings of beings, I knew that. And so I fought all night long. They told me later on, I not only pulled the mattress cover off of the mattress, I pulled the mattress up on me because I had to stay. I had to wait. I had to wait till Ron got there. Whatever he had to do, I had to wait. But I would, again, and then I would leave, and I would, I would be going down like a deep, deep, dark terror. Now, my, my skin began to get cold. Now, it's not like cold when you walk out into the air. It's like bone, bone chilling cold in my lower extremities. And you can feel the coldness begin to come up the legs. And again, I would begin to leave. Now, and I would be in that darkness, and I'd be in that void. Uh, and I remember one time entering back in my body, because when I entered my body, it was like, just like that. I felt my body thud, my physical body thud when I entered back in. Now, I, believe me, believe me, that is the most horrifying, terrifying experience that I've ever encountered. And I fought all night long, and the next morning, somewhere 9, 30, 10 o'clock, in came Ron. And Ron came in and he says, Dr. Whitaker, what do they say is your chances? I said, Ron, they tell me I have none. He says, now's the time. And I said, you're right. I mean, I'd cursed him, I'd spit at him, but now was the time because I had to have whatever he had because I had a short period of time on earth and I didn't know I have any idea when I might make that trip and go all the way. At that time, Ron led me simply in the sinner's prayer. Now, I had no idea what the sinner's prayer was, but I see, I trusted Ron. But he led me in the sinner's prayer and told me that Jesus had died for my sins. He had died for the sins of the world. Uh, I didn't quite understand that. But I knew, you know, he showed me in the Word of God where it said that. Now, you have to understand, I'm a man of books. I've spent a big part of my life, 25, 26 years of my life, in books. Uh, in, you know, all types of scientific books. Uh, chemistry, like I said, degree in chemistry, advanced degrees, uh, all the way out to the medicine doctor to practice medicine, all of these degrees. So he told me, and I believed him because it's in this book, and it was a new book unto me, and it was called the Bible. And so I led, I, 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 I let Ron lead me in the sinner's prayer, and I, I said the sinner's prayer after him, and I can tell you one thing. There was a peace that came over me like I had never known. I'd searched for that peace. I'd searched for it in the bottles, alcohol. I'd searched for it in needles. I'd searched for it in drugs. I'd searched for it with women. I'd searched for it in all types of places. But there was no peace in my life. But once I accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, I was no longer afraid. I still believed I was going to die because I knew the condition I had is that you do not survive it. I knew that. I'm a physician. I knew what I had. You did not survive. And he shows me in the Word of God. It says, These signs shall follow those that believe. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. I walk around on planet Earth this day taking no insulin, taking no enzymes, eating whatsoever that I might, and God produces in my body every day the correct material for me to function without having to take medication. You know, when you see blind eyes open, you see the cripples walk, you see the leopards cleanse, and you see them with your own eyes, you know, you, you see that, then it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out 
that you know the Bible is true. The prayer of faith, the prayer of salvation is not some just little prayer. It's the only way to the Father. And that's the only way. Now, all of these people that in the New Age movement that believe that everybody's going to heaven, that you can worship anything, you worship a flea, you can, you can squeeze a tree, uh, you can worship a crystal, you can worship the star. I got news for them. They're not, you know, they're not going uh, unless they accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior because the Word says the only way to the Father is through the Son.